Hi, this is Beatles author Mark Lewison and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci. Hello, hello, and this is Steve Marinucci welcoming you to another episode of Things we said today are weekly discussion of Beatle news. I'm, as I said, I'm Steve Marinucci, the author of the Beatles Examiner and many other Examiner columns on Beatle news. And I'm joined across the country and almost across the universe by my co-host, <laughs> the man who hosts the weekly Every Little Thing uh, show uh, on radio, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. This week we have... Yes, another author. Yes, we do. And this is uh, going to be an interesting discussion. We're going to talk about writings about the Beatles with um, Melissa Davis, who is the co-author of the two Beatle bibliographies. Um, uh, They just issued a supplement, first supplement, but there are two volumes now. And um, we'd like to welcome Melissa. Melissa, welcome. Hi. Hi. Hi, is it, it? Do I say Doctor Melissa? <laughs> no, no, just uh, not not quite. Just in the initials MD, but I'm not okay. a PhD. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, that, that was quick. Really. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the book in general. The books in general first. The idea behind the Beatles bibliography was what? Well. Uh, as you know, I got my master's degree in the Beatle program at Hope, Liverpool Hope University in Liverpool. And my professor, Mike Brocken, had been putting together a bibliography for probably 10 years. But, you know, obviously he was, he was busy with establishing the first master's level program in the world on the Beatles, you know, selling it to the university and getting it uh, up and running. So I had talked to him about turning my dissertation into a book when I graduated. And uh, during one tutorial, he said, how would you like to help me finish the bibliography first? And then we can see about uh, about doing something else. And obviously, I was humbled. I was honored. I was scared to death. And um, so once I turned in my dissertation, and he was no longer in a position of grading my work for, for my degree, we went to work on his bibliography. Hmm. We should point out that for anyone that hasn't seen this book before, this is an excellent reference book if you want to find out what books have been written about the Beatles through the years, and also articles as well. And there's even uh, a section there on websites on the Beatles and even sheet music as well. So if you've ever Mm -hmm. thought about a certain book and maybe you wasn't sure what the title was, but you knew who the author was, there's a cross-reference that you can do here in this book that's very useful. So if you said to yourself, well, I remember Nicholas Schaffner wrote a book. What was it? And then you look it up, and it's right there in the book. So there's a combination of articles and books. And like I said, there there are smaller uh, sections there on uh, the other items that I mentioned. But it's really indispensable. And uh, one thing that's very useful is that Melissa and Michael, both when they've read these books or articles, they give you their own short review on them. Uh, to kind of advise you whether or not uh, this material is worthwhile reading. So um, why don't we discuss what the process is like for you to pick this material? I mean, just to start with the bibliography <laughs> from the very beginning, that's got to be the most daunting task, you know, to try to find as many uh, books and articles on the Beatles that are out there. There's, there's a gazillion of them. And I'm sure that you must have thought there's no way we're going to get to all of them. And... How do you decipher what goes in the book and what doesn't go in the book? And if there there's certain material that you're not crazy about, do you automatically put in everything that you read, or are there some things that you might say, well, it's it's not worth it's not worth our while? Well, you raise a lot of interesting points. Our main goal was to make it uh, comprehensive, so we did want to include books and articles. We wanted to keep it as up-to-date as possible, which is why we knew we'd have to start using supplements. But, you know, Amazon, obviously, you you go to it and you see literally thousands of books 
about the Beatles. I don't think there's any way you could ever have a complete bibliography, so we, we try to stay away from that word and just say comprehensive. Hmm. Obviously, you start with the basics. We all know, you know, starting with Hunter Davies' work and, and going forward, up, you know, through Lewison and everything in between. Some of that we had read before, obviously. Um, and then you start looking at the footnotes in there and they reference their sources. You start building with that. And, um, you know, God bless Google and the Internet because you can start looking for Beatle articles. And and then once it became known that we were working on the project, we would have people email, call us. I, I got a call from a gentleman in, in Germany, and he said, I have a private collection, and, and you need to know about it. So we've been very fortunate in that people have started giving us some information about books that are out there, sending local newspaper clippings. And then, you know, I have to say it, the Beatles Examiner is in my inbox every morning, and there's an interview with an author, there's an announcement. It's it's just a wonderful source. So, you know, we get something in, and really, in order to comment on it, you must read it, even if it seems pretty dire at the beginning. And if you've read through those annotations, you know we can be brutally honest. Melissa, first of all, thank you for those comments. I really appreciate that uh, about the column. But I wanted to go back and talk about the beginnings of, of Beatle writings. And um, you mentioned um, the Hunter Davies book, but uh, I'm thinking of the Michael Braun book as probably the first significant book. And I don't want to take away from what uh, Bill Harry did with with Mercy Bee because mm-hmm. that's all, obviously very historic. But as far as a book goes, right. The Michael Braun book, I believe, is the, is the first significant book on the Beatles. Is that am I am I right about that, or do you agree? I think that's true uh, chronologically. I think the difference, of course, is that um, Hunt Davies had access to the Beatles and was and their families and was able to interact and observe them in addition to just compiling information about them. And I think the degree to which they trusted him, made for a very, very different type of book. So, uh, yeah, but I think you're right. Chronologically, Braun came first. And the thing about Braun is that he was not, um, unlike later on when all the teen magazines got involved and there was a very, they they weren't as serious. The Braun book was right. relatively serious about in, in its approach, which was definitely... Uh, definitely set it apart from some of the stuff later on. And, oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's still, a, uh, if uh, if anybody listening is not familiar with the book, it is available. Amazon Co. UK has it, but you're not going it, to, it's, I don't, I'm not sure if it's in print, and I don't believe you're going to be able to find it for a really, really cheap price. You can find it. It's not that expensive, though, but I believe it can be found. Ken? Melissa, I noticed in the supplement that there are a lot of articles that stem from 1964, and I'm sure a lot of that has to do with the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' arrival in America, articles that appeared in the New York Times and in the Daily News, for example. Of all the early articles that you read or Michael read, were there any that you found to be more interesting? Because from what I've read in in the Beatles' bibliography and the supplement, the majority of those articles dealt with anything but their music. It dealt with their look. It dealt with the fans' hysteria. Was there anything that was, like like um, Steve was just talking about, anything more serious early on that you found to be rather interesting? Well, you know, you bring up a good point. My dissertation was actually about the U.S. reception of the Beatles in February of 1964. And so I... I had worked with a lot of those New York Times, Washington Post articles before, but when I came back to look at them to do, you know, annotations for the bibliographies, it just hits you that the press generally was very slow on the uptake. It's a lot like looking at the Alexander Kendrick piece that was done for CBS television. Mm-hmm. They tend to vie with each other, you know, for the most clever, demeaning word for mop top, dish rag, uh, prince valiant, old cut, for the hairdos. They're concentrating on the hair. Hmm. They're, uh, and certainly in Kendrick's case, he's very uh, dismissive of them and attributes much of their success to having good press agents. But the 
the articles in the Times, even, they were a little bit more respectful, but they concentrated on it being flash in the pan, uh, a fad, uh, kind of like the questions that Steele's always got about, what are you going to do when the bubble bursts? Right. And um, I'm sorry to say, you don't really find a lot. However, there was one very brave reporter who covered the Shostakovich appearance at Carnegie Hall. And he um, made a reference to how he was a fan. And Leonard Bernstein was a fan. And Aaron Copeland was a huge fan of the Beatles. And he, the New York Times reporter, jumped on that. And it was covered in one article, I believe, the week following the Sullivan Show, which would have been the week the Beatles were at, at the Carnegie Hall as well. And so there was one reporter who really was brave enough to, to print that and to go to the greats in classical music at the time and get their opinions. And since they were fans, that was news. So there is one out there. I'm trying to remember. I think it was... Maybe it was Leonard Bernstein or it was Arthur Fiedler who actually said that he went to see the Beatles in concert at the Cavern? Yes, it was, uh, I believe it was Arthur Fiedler. He had actually gone to Liverpool to, I believe, work with the Liverpool Philharmonic. And uh, he did. He actually had seen the Beatles before they got here. And um, th- there was a whole group of classical or traditional uh, composers who absolutely recognized instantly that this was different, and uh, they they championed their cause early on with the press. It's very interesting, Steve. Um, Melissa, you, you guys talk uh, in the beginning of the first book um, the evolution of Beatle writing from the '60s to now, um, and which I thought was really interesting, and especially now because it seems like there are so many people out there writing and a lot of people uh, especially especially some of the the more gossipy writings really don't have a clue but in general how would you say that the beatle writing has writing about the beatles has evolved from the 60s to now is that i know uh, that's probably a massive question but, <laughs> but, but I was you did say that you, would make a wonderful dissertation there we go <laughs> There we go. But I mean, you did you did kind of character, do some characterizing in the in the uh, first book, which I thought was kind of interesting. Is it more for the music now, or the personality, or both? It's beyond that. I think now, especially as it goes into the second fifty years, and we're looking at third generation Beatle fans right now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's going into mythic at this point. Um, going into, you see going a little what? bit of mythic. Okay. It's the, the Beatles almost as something beyond themselves and beyond their music, actually, I think, at this point. Because you saw the trajectory. I mean, Hunt Davies did a terrific book. Brown had done some good work before. And then you saw the Beatles' music taking center stage in most of the writing. There's a wonderful piece in the supplement that is about... Uh, a writer for Horizon Magazine, uh, Dunfeld, and he wrote a fantastic essay on them, on the music for Horizon Magazine, which was a an arts uh, magazine in, in the late 60s. And so you saw some concentration as they began not only to change music, but to explore it. And you had people actually doing serious writing, probably from the time of, of Sgt. Pepper. You saw them really taking an interest, and oh, you know, there's a smidgen of that in '64 with the Iola cadences, but that was just a joke. This stuff, they were really looking at the music, mm-hmm. and then the Beatles broke up, and you had the Rolling Stone interviews with John Lennon. You had a little bit more about the personalities because you would have writers focusing on the the Beatle that they wanted to champion. So you had the Paul articles and you had the John articles. And that was pretty much how I saw the 70s and maybe the 80s going. Then I think there was a little bit of reflective time. People like Mark Lewison started doing real research. And so you had the Chronicles come out. And, you know, you started getting a little bit of a movement back to how did that happen? 
Now we're 50 years out, and this would be the equivalent of, in 1967, looking back at Rudy Valley and, and loving Rudy Valley records. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not criticizing him. I'm just saying there's no reason for people in popular music to be looking back at the Beatles, except they've become something much more. They have a meaning. They have a purpose in, in people's lives now that was unexpected. So now I think people are trying to invent, how do we write about the Beatles in the second 50 years? This is unprecedented. And one of the ways they write about them is, is, is sort of, you know, trying to pull it all together like Lewis is trying to do. You see a lot of people writing their memories. You see people coming forward, maybe looking at, you know, I'm getting older, I knew the Beatles, I want to tell my story. Good old Frida, uh, Larry Kane was on that 64, 65 tour cycle. You get people wanting to get that down. So we're kind of finding our way in the 50th, but it's a whole new genre that people are inventing. Melissa, I'm finding that um, there are a lot of interesting books that have come out recently where authors are trying to explore different angles on the Beatles or stories that haven't been told. And I'm always fascinated with that because we always thought, what hasn't been said about the Beatles? And apart from the meticulous research that Mark Lewison has done, you've got people like David Bedford coming forward and writing a book like Liddy Pool or the Fab 104, where they're looking at every venue in Liverpool that has a place in the Beatles' history or every single person that had even the slightest connection with the Beatles or may have had some kind of effect on the evolution of the group. Are you finding that more and more, or is that, you know, that's, that's what I'm observing right now? Or more intense study of their music. That's another thing that I'm that I'm finding. Well, I think you're right. I think there are two reasons for that. I think people are trying to contextualize. As I said, we're trying to figure out not just how did this happen, but why did it happen? Why did it happen there in Liverpool and why then at that in, in that period of time? What went into it? And so you see people like David Bedford with his work that seek to you know, contextualize that. What about Liverpool made this happen? How did it all percolate up from there? Anybody who's been to, to England recently knows that there's still that southern prejudice against the north, you know, sort of well, whatever happens up there. And I think looking at that has, has come full circle, and, and people are saying, what about the city? What about the demographics? What was going on there at the time? What about the economic decline? And, and the Beatles' personal family histories in that economy. That's important. They're looking to contextualize it. And certainly, you know, Larry Kane's work, when they were boys, he goes back to Liverpool and he interviews a lot of people and, and does try to pull together the hidden histories of the Beatles. Some of as you said, who may have had what they thought was a slight interaction with a young kid who had a guitar. And then suddenly, it has more meaning now in context. Mm -hmm. So I think you you will be seeing a lot of that. I think there's less writing about their music now. There's more writing about the thing that it became, the actual presence of the Beatles and the fact that they're still relevant today, which, as I said, is unprecedented. Steve? Have, have the, uh, has, the, has that relevance... Um, do you think that relevance translates to intense um, love by the fans as much today uh, as it was a few years ago. Um, I'm obviously not going back to the 60s, but, I mean, how, how intense do you think it is now? You know, I see it among a lot of a lot of young people. I lecture, and the people, the 20-year-olds, 18 to 22-year-olds, in the 80s, you didn't find that. You found people that were middle-aged Beatle fans, and they were playing Beatle music for their kids. Now I'm seeing a lot of college-age kids, and younger, actually, who are very vehement about their loyalties and their fandom. And I'll, I can give you, you know, just a, a couple of quick examples. Uh, I have a button that I wear on a jacket. That's just a simple Beatle button. You go into Petco to get cat food, and suddenly there's a 17-year-old kid saying, I love the Beatles. And and they say it with such passion, you know, that I, I thought, I, I didn't even remember why he was looking at my jacket. 
Oh, yeah, I've got a button on it. And uh, at a lecture recently, one of the students came up afterwards and said, okay, how do you stand on John versus Paul? <laughs> and he said it in that tone. He was invested. He had a preference, and he was ready to argue it and, and provide evidence for his opinion. It was wonderful to see his passion. You know, obviously, I, I had to tell him, and Lennon and McCartney. So there isn't a John versus Paul. And he said, well, don't you think Paul was the balladeer? And I said, okay, we'll never listen to Helter Skelter again. We just won't listen to Back in the USSR. Well, I'm down. And if that means John is the heavy rocker, I guess we can't listen to Julia ever again. And so, you know, we had a discussion. But you're seeing younger fans very passionate about the Beatles and, and what they have come to mean in their lives. You know, Recently, a friend of mine became a, a, a grandmother, and I went to Amazon, and my goodness, look at the CDs, Beatle Baby Music. It, it was inconceivable 50 years ago. It's, it's really amazing how, how much they've, especially the, the, with the recent media attention they got with the 50th anniversary, you know, the uh, and all the, the sudden uh, reemergence on the Billboard charts, um, that explosion for there for a couple of weeks, that was um that was pretty amazing. You couldn't go to the grocery store without finding a special issue from People, USA Today, Rolling Stone. They all had their special issues out about the 50th anniversary. So they were everywhere. Mm-hmm. Melissa, and? this this is a departure just a little bit. Since we are talking about young people discovering the Beatles, apart from this select moment in time when it is a significant anniversary, how do you suppose young people are finding them? I mean, I find an incredible disconnect between commercial radio, terrestrial radio, and the public and youth. You know, a lot of people don't, a lot of young people don't really listen as much to terrestrial radio anymore. They might listen to uh, internet radio or or discover music on YouTube or uh, through shared uh, services like uh, Spotify. But how do you think young people are finding this music now and having this passionate feeling about the Beatles from music that is 40 to 50 years older? How are they finding out about this? I think what's happening is we are really looking at more generations, or rather, we're looking at a generational phenomenon. The Beatles were so important to people who were watching Ed Sullivan, and that that was appointment TV. We all had to be there at the same time to turn on television to watch it, or we would have missed it. It was not going to be on in a rerun. There was no tape. There was no DVR. We had to be there, and we shared it. The people who enjoyed the music then and discovered it and then grew with the Beatles had children, and those children are now having children, and we're seeing the Beatles, their music certainly, but also the Beatles themselves as an entity. We're seeing that, I think, handed down from generation to generation. It's become a part of our cultural being. And just as in the past, you know, people would give their children their cultural training, if you will. We're seeing that. We're seeing... 17-year-old kids buying Beatle music. They listened to it in the car. They, their parents went out and they, they, uh, you know, bought their, uh, they, they showed them the movies. They played them the music. They listened to it. And it's still good music. So somewhere it took seed in there. I, I went to see a, a tribute band perform with the uh, Boulder Symphony five years ago, even before I went to Liverpool for my master's. And it wasn't the 50th anniversary. It was just a, a band that played with symphonies. And I was at the CU campus. I thought I was going to be alone. Well, you know, it was standing room only. I think I was among the oldest people in the audience. This was a Saturday night. College kids there on dates or fraternity brothers together. And during the intermission, this young guy turned to me and he said, Are you, are you loving it? And I said, Well, I, I don't know how I feel about tribute bands. And this kid said, well, you know what? This is the closest we're ever going to get, and I love it. <laughs> you know, and, and he's passionate about it. 
you know, I, I think he thought that I didn't understand how important it was to him. So I, I, it's a generational thing. People are handing it down to their children because it is it was a thing of value to them, and they're giving it to their children and their grandchildren. I just, um, as a matter of fact, on my radio program, my other radio program, I interviewed a young kid who's a student at the college where I do my radio show, and he's got to be maybe 19, 20 years old, and he loves the Beatles. And a lot of the music he, he learned from going to see Paul in concert. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's another way that their music, mm-hmm. the music that they did as a band, and also the solo music, can be, can be discovered by young people. Right. I, yeah, I mean, if you go see McCartney, I, I saw him at Wrigley Field two years ago. I saw him on both days. And it's astonishing that you see families, little kids, families with teenagers, people on dates. Uh, and so you're right. You know, somebody goes to a concert and they may have never heard it before live, and they're hooked. It's still very good music. I think that's a big part of it. It comes down to it's very good music, and it is standing the test of time by and large. I think what's really interesting, too, is the fact that the Beatles are not um, are completely apart from a lot of what's popular today, in other words, in terms of what they represent, and still they've been able to attract a young audience that normally wouldn't go for something like that, if you understand what I'm saying. I mean, they like edgy things. They like edgy things. Um, right. And the Beatles aren't, although they were edgy to a certain extent in 64, they certainly aren't now. And... Um, that's the, well, that, you would I, think so. You, but, you know, you might be. You might think so. I would think that. Oh my goodness, they would be considered, you know, sort of fuddy duddies or parents' music or something like that. But I, I've had enough young people at lectures tell me that they they do perceive the Beatles as being different, and they almost attribute them to being avant garde by comparison to what we would consider popular teenager or popular young person music now. You know, a lot of them feel that the music has gone beyond edgy to positively dark, or you know, I've had them say, you know, music today is too angry for me, or it's too, I find it very negative, I find it very hostile. They Mm. use those words, I don't. And so, to them, a lot of these kids who are listening to it are finding the Beatles to be a refreshing new voice. And they're finding the Beatles messages in the lyrics to be avant-garde, and they're certainly finding the fact that it isn't computer-driven music to be very avant-garde. You know, they're seeing that as something that nobody else knows how to do. It's not the way I would have thought, but it's it's out there. It, it, I hear it from kids I lecture to. That's really right. interesting, uh, because as someone who listens a lot to commercial radio, um, the different formats in radio are very formulaic and the Beatles Mm -hmm. what they did as a band and what they continue to do on their own were anything but formulaic and they're just musically so eclectic and the fact that young people are finding that refreshing the fact that you can hear anything from not just rockers and ballads but very experimental music Indian music classical music Mm -hmm. and you know in a way apart from the real weird stuff like Revolution Number no. 9, in a way, that is avant-garde, to be so widespread like that and for young people to really um, embrace that. It's very encouraging. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that. I'm, I'm hearing that there is... It may be that um, music has, has just gone too far. When I, As I said, when I have a student say to me, it's not edgy anymore, it's just ugly. It's just, I, you know, it, and it's all the same, and it's all computer-driven. It sounds the same. You make a good point. No two Beatle albums sound the same. And within every album, you can't find a lot of repetition of any type of genre. As you said, you know, you've got ballads and Indian music and electronics and mm-hmm. silly stuff and serious. And it's, when you look at it that way, this would be an edgier place to visit musically than to just be listening to the same sound over and over. Right. Do you have a, um, given 
we're talking again about Beagle writing uh, then versus now. Is it is it harder today to pick out really good Beagle writing um, that's being done? Well, I don't know that it's harder. I mean, it, certainly there wasn't much out in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And now you're getting some real solid research, certainly, what Lewison is doing. And you are getting the hidden histories, things like uh, that, that Larry Kane is able to bring out very, very well uh, about the people, the individuals. Maybe we've never heard of them, but the people that contributed to the story. And uh, Dave Bedford's doing that as well. So actually, I think there seems to be a lot of good Beatle writing coming out right now. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's the focus because of the 50s. Maybe it's that enough time has elapsed. We're really getting new perspective. But um, I don't I, I don't see any of it tapering off. You know, of course, now we have a lot of Lewis and Tullet to Right. So, uh, no, I, 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 think it's, I think the writing right now is, is pretty good. As I, as, I, as I said on a previous show, I hope I'm around for, for his other two books. I really do. And I, 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 for some of the for some of the first generation fans, I don't know how you feel about this, Melissa, but I mean, I'm really, really concerned about that. That uh, I hope I'm around for the, for his other two books. That's yeah. I I'm a I was a history major and I taught history. And William Manchester, great author, began mm-hmm. a series on on well, you probably know on Winston Churchill, and they were mm-hmm. magnificent Pulitzer Prize winning books. And halfway through the 1930s, I became alarmed because I thought, William Manchester isn't going to make it. He's not going to outlive Churchill's story. And I was panic-stricken that I was going to read that William Manchester died before Mm -hmm. he could finish. And sure enough, there was a long, long delay. But, you know, for the, the book about World War II, he didn't even make it to World War II. Mm-hmm. And they were able to solicit someone, you know, to finish the, that one. But the series was not finished because he didn't outlive Churchill. And <laughs> I, you know, I when I met Mark Lewison at the book launch in Liverpool, I shook his hand and I said, you know, are you eating healthy? Are you are you getting enough sleep? We all have to take <laughs> care of you so you can outlive the story. And um, the minute I said, you know, I don't want another William Manchester incident, he said, I know, wasn't that awful? So he knew what I meant. He had to take care of himself. That's 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 a great story. That's a, that's a great story. Ken? Melissa, are there any books in particular in the supplement? I know that it doesn't cover Mark Lewison's first volume, but are there any that really surprised you that were, you know, books that you really praised that you weren't expecting to like so much. I mean, we we've touched upon Larry Kane and uh, Hunter Davies put out the really wonderful book of the John Lennon letters, which uh, is just uh, you know indispensable as far as I'm concerned. Jim Birkenstadt's book on Jimmy Nickel, I love a lot. Are there any that really that really surprised you, or wasn't one that you expected to be as good as it was? Well, I, I think you've mentioned them. I I thought having Hunter Davies work on John's letters was wonderful because he knew them and he likes them but he isn't slavish he isn't uh and he doesn't have an angle obviously he he likes john he likes all of them but he didn't he didn't have an axe to grind and i thought he did a beautiful job i i do think i agree with you that is an indispensable work for any any beetle fan must have it Mm -hmm. um and and the others that you mentioned as well there are good things out there i enjoyed Larry Kane's book. I enjoyed Dave Bedford's work about Liddy Pool. Mm-hmm. I really liked that. But they didn't surprise me as much as Frederick R. Grunfeld. G-R-U-N-F-E-L-D. This is a hidden treasure. It was a long essay in the arts magazine Horizon. I mentioned it before. It was written in 1968. And it's, uh, it's not a magazine. It's, it's an actual book. Mm-hmm. It's marvelous. It absolutely took me by surprise. I hadn't even heard of it. My brother found it in a used bookstore. It's wonderful. Highly recommended. It comes out in 68, and so it uh, peppers new. You know, it's, the White Album hasn't come out yet. It's a gem. And that one took me by surprise. Hmm. 
Yeah. Let I me just, mention one other book. Uh, I, I don't know if you've heard of this one. It's called The Beatles, The Press Reports by W. Fraser Sandercomb. And, mm-hmm. basic, yes. and it basically it distills um, articles from the de- from the day, and um, runs and it's all stuff that uh, not normal you wouldn't normally find in um, in books. And it's a great. It's a, there's actually three books in the series. There's a Led Zeppelin book and there's a Pink Floyd book. But the 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 Beatles book is just great, and I have it sitting on my desk and I refer to it a lot. But, um, I, I think that's in the in the bibliography, the main bibliography. Is it um, okay? I believe it's okay. in there, yeah. Because I actually I used it when I was doing my dissertation, so okay. I, I'm familiar with it. It's an excellent work too. What's up for the next uh, supplement? And when it, when is it due? Ah, <laughs> Mr. Lewison is going to feature in in obviously in the next supplement. The first one took a little bit more time than we wanted. I was holding out hope that Lewis's book would be published in time. So I kept pushing the deadline and pushing the deadline. Finally, I actually had to leave to go to Liverpool to go to the book launch, and so I had to cut it and say, October 1st, done. That's it. And so uh, we will have both of the editions of Mark Lewis's in the supplement. And the second supplement, I'm hoping September, because... There's going to be enough with, uh, you know, a compare and contrast between the single volume with the two volume set and everything else that has come out with the 50th anniversaries. There's going to be enough there. I think it will make a, a significant size supplement. So September, I'm, I hope. I'm guessing, I'm guessing that's going to be a, a much bigger volume than the first supplement. I right? think so. I mean, this yeah. one went into what something like 168 pages or something. I'm, I'm betting it'll top out around 200. One thing we did with the first supplement is we included an article. So it, it could, you know, there'd be something a little extra for people who wanted to read more. I don't know whether we're going to do that with the second. It would be nice to, to offer something new, but we'll see how big it gets. We ship them free, so, you know, we need to, <laughs> we need to figure the, the actual weight of the book in at this point. Mm-hmm. I do want to also mention one thing. One of the advantages in getting the Beatles bibliography is that you find out about a lot of books that were not released in the United States. So, um, you know, for example, I found out about uh, a book you might want to comment about because you did a little annotation on it from Robert Sellers called Very Naughty Boys, The Amazing True Story (laughs) of Handmade Films. So it's the whole story of George's film company, and I never knew there was a book on that before, and it only came out in the UK, correct? I think so. That's right. That's, right. That's where I had to pick it up. Uh, isn't that fun? I mean, you know, if, if I wasn't the person doing the research and writing these books, I would be the person reading them, probably, in the library, but, you know, I would want to read this stuff. Who knew about about this little gem of a book all about handmade films and it gives you a different perspective. You know, here's George Harrison, not as a Beatle, not as a guitarist, not as somebody who's interested in going to India, not as somebody who meditates. This is somebody who is a business executive after the debacle of Apple. And in seeing how he did this and not in music, in film, I thought it was fascinating. Mm. You know, I, I loved knowing that when he was active in the business, Every staff person had a birthday cake on their birthday. What a little tidbit, you know, but uh-huh. he did that. He was very, you know, uh, he was a hands-on executive. Or hearing how he dealt with Sean Penn and Madonna when they were, you know, pretty much destroying a film or interacting with Bonnie Python. That's great stuff. Yeah, I, I wrote about that book several years, uh, a couple of years ago. I remember, I remember writing about it. And, um, yeah, it's a very interesting book. You know, certainly like uh, Jim Birkenstaff's book about Jimmy Nickel. Mm-hmm. There's a hidden history. You know, is it is it central to the Beatles story? Well, it's not anecdotal, I'll tell you that. It is important. And I just love the way Jim Birkenstaff went after that like a detective and pulls out a hidden history that needs to be considered. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. That, I mean, uh, what a, what a, I mean, that very fascinating discussion. I really, I really enjoyed talking talking with you about this stuff. Same um, here. We'll look forward to. Well, 
Thanks for asking me. And we'll look forward to the to the supplement, hopefully in September. And um, let us know what else you what else you guys are doing. Um, you know, we'd love to have you uh, on here again to talk about. I mean, we could have talked about books for all all afternoon. <laughs> but anyway, uh, thank you again, Melissa, for for being with us. Um, we uh, we really enjoyed it. Well, thanks for having me on. I think you can tell I just love talking about the Beatles. And this is Steve Marinucci saying we will see you next time. Thanks, Steve. And thanks to Melissa Davis for joining us. And if you'd like to purchase a copy of the Beatles bibliography and the first supplement, all you got to do is visit this website, thebeetleworksltd.com. That's thebeetleworksltd.com. This is Ken Michael saying thanks so much for joining us, and I'll see